Okay, so we wait for this to boot. Um, so, so the goal of this talk was to uh, give you um, an overview of some statistical methods that I used uh, typically in uh, statistics and informatics and you know other fields and physics. And I think it's it's useful for even for physicists to learn about these techniques because uh, you know as more and more data is made available uh, through very precise experiments. Uh, it, it's becoming increasingly important to be able to, to fit and interpret this data in some meaningful ways, uh, you know, preferably using physical systems. But sometimes the data is not very good, and so it's good to, to have some you know, the basic tools and techniques that uh, statisticians have been developing, uh, mm. usually also in, in met, you know, using methods very close to statistical mechanics. The, well, first I need to, to uh, so I mean you can think of, of two ways of doing theory I'm just going to draw the slide I was going to show uh, one of them is it's you, you start from a model, so you have a physical model, you have differential equations, you have a Hamiltonian, you have something like that. And you know, your goal as a theorist would be to solve that model for a certain range of parameters. And then you, you look at your experimental data, and you know, you, very often it's, quite, it's uh, qualitative. Uh, if you're lucky, it can be quantitative. And then you can make a prediction uh, using your model to explain the data in some in some way, okay. But there's also another way of doing things, which uh, is to start from the data, and to do this you need to have extremely good data. And instead of you know writing first the model and trying to solve it, uh, the idea would be to from the data learn the, the model itself. Okay, and so that's that's, if you like, an inverse problem. And you know this I would call some sort of a bottom-up approach. So you start from the microscopic equations. You start from the what you think makes sense, typically using physical equations, and you you work your way to you know the the phenomenon you want to explain. This one will be more like top-down. You start from the data you have, but in some cases, the, the system is so complicated that you don't really know what, what's the right physical descriptions for it. And if there is a physical description, it, it might be quite effective. Oh my god, I'm going to twist my neck with this. This is very high. <laughs> All right, so this is working. Okay. Okay. So, so the goal is to from from data to try and learn the model. So, since this is a, a course, uh, I wanted to start with very basic things, and to try to explain what model fitting is to start with. Okay. So, may, probably many of you already know these things. Uh, probably many of you think they know these things, but I'm going to go a bit more into the detail, and uh, bear with me. Then next we will talk about more uh, practical applications and more interesting applications, hopefully. This was not there. Okay, so the 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 framework we're going to I'm going to present today is uh, essentially a, a Bayesian framework or, or maximum likelihood framework, and it goes like this. Um, imagine that you have a, a model which is parameterized by some uh, parameters theta. Okay, so theta is a, is a list of parameters, and uh, this model you assume is intrinsically probabilistic. So even if, in fact, your, your physical model is not probabilistic, it's very likely that the data that you measure uh, that would be generated by this model would itself be stochastic because there's some errors in your, exper in, in your experiment or in, in whatever data you have. So you describe this model by the probability of producing a certain data set given the parameters of your model. Now, typically, when you do experiments, you do several experiments, you collect several data points. So typically, what you have is you have a collection of data points, 
A going from 1 to M. So you have M data points, and M will be an important parameter. It will determine how, how well you sampled your, uh, your model. And if you assume that your experiments are independent of each other, uh, meaning that the experimental error is independent from one uh, assay to the next, then you can factorize this probability distribution, and then it's just the product of, prob of the probability of getting a given data point given the model. And what we want to do is, uh, this we can always write if we have you know, a model a priori, but what we want to do is wanna, we want to have a Bayesian approach. By, by this I mean that what we're actually interested in is the model, not the data. Okay? So we want to know, given the data, what is the probability that it's a certain model that gives rise to this data? Okay? And in particular, if I want to know the parameters of my model, I will want to, I will write this probability of the probability that it was these parameters that created, that generated these data. And it's a Bayesian approach because it relies on, on, ba on Bayes' rule, which is the following, which is just a, you know, a very uh, elementary uh, probabilistic uh, identity, which says that <coughs> The probability of the model given the data is actually proportional to the probability of the data being generated by the model in the first place, so it's the thing that typically we can calculate, times the probability of the model a priori. Okay? So this thing here is called the prior. Typically it's, it's taken to be flat because we have no reason to, to think a model is more likely than another one before seeing the data. This would be the likelihood, so it's the evidence given by the data, so, that, so that's the information that's given to you by, by the data about the model. And this is the posterior, so that's now the knowledge you have about the model given the data. And this is just a normalization constant because what you're interested in is in distribution over the models. Everything clear so far? Again, uh, I repeat, don't, don't hesitate to ask any question, uh, interrupt, and I'll repeat the question. Okay. So the, the maximum likelihood uh, approach, which you may have heard about, is to just maximize this likelihood part here. It, it's just equivalent to saying that the prior is flat. So you just remove it, and since this is just a, a normalization constant, you just maximize this over the different parameters of your model. So you'll find the, the model that best explains the data. And when you have many data points, because here you, uh, this is a product, if you take the, you know, maximizing P or maximizing its log is the same thing. And if you take the log of that, it becomes a sum. So you can just have a sum over the log P of each of your data points. So this is a bit theoretical, so let me just, a bit abstract, let's say, so let me give a very concrete example. Uh, imagine that you, you have a bias coin, uh, and you don't know its bias, right? So it, you know it, it, won't, it will give you heads and tails, but not with probability one half, but with some probability, it will give you head with some probability p, which could be anything between zero and one, and you don't know it, okay? Now you do 10 experiments, and out of that you get three heads, and the question is, what's, what's the probability of the next outcome? In other words, what's your estimate of what P could be? Okay. So if you do a, a naive estimate, you say, okay, I mean, it's very naive because you, you have very few data points. You say that it's a 30%, okay? Three times out of 10, I, I got ahead, so the probability of the next one is ahead is also 30%. And in fact, if you apply the principle of maximum likelihood, so you write the probability that you have the data given P, it's just given by this binomial distribution, okay? And you maximize this over P. So you, you, P is your unknown here, right? That's the probability of having head, it's the thing you don't know. So what you do here is that you do the inversion, you look for the P that maximizes this probability. And if you do this, you find 30%. So that's a naive estimate. Now you can do something else. You can also do what's called the Bayesian average, 
uh, meaning that instead of taking you know, the, the p that maximizes this, I'm just going to take an average of a p weighted by the probability given by this. And it, it, you know, it boils down to this, to this integral. Well, what you get in the end is one third. So you notice it's a different result, okay? slightly different. But really, I mean, probably neither of these answers is the, is the, is the, tr is the right one, right? Because we have so few data points. Instead, the right way to think about this is to think of a probability distribution, which is essentially given by this, that we look something like that. The maximum here will be at 0.3, so that would be you know, p star. And here you have the average of p, which would be one third. But really, yeah. Really, you have this whole range of possible outcome of possible p's here that are consistent with the data. If instead of having 10 draws, you had like 300 draws, then you get something closer to, and you, you get, yeah, sorry, if you, instead of having 10 draws, you had 1,000 draws, and you got 300 out of those being heads, then you trust that this bias is close to 30% much more. Right? And if you write this posterior distribution, we're now replacing, you know, 10 by 1,000, this by 300, you'll find something very, very, very peaked indeed. So you still have a distribution, but the width of it is much smaller. But there are many cases where the data is so noisy and you have so few data points that you are in that situation. So where you, don't, you, you have just have a range of, possible, of possibilities for the, for the model. Now let me move on to a second example, which you all know as well, which is also very simple. It's a, it's a fitting of a function. So let's say that you have uh, these data points here, x, y, and you want to approximate these data points by a polynomial. Okay. So you can, you can put this into your favorite uh, f you know, fitting program in MATLAB or in R or, or Python or whatever. Um, here, the, the parameters of the model are just the coefficients of the polynomial, obviously, but also here, the, the degree of the polynomial. So this is the set of parameters. So I'll give you the answer already. These, you know, the, the right polynomial is a polynomial of order three, and it's this one, okay? Now, if you try to fit with a polynomial of degree one, you get something like this. The green one is just a line, so it would be a very poor fit. The green two, it would still be a poor fit. It's a parabola. The green three, it gets much better, much closer to the actual one. And then as you increase the degree, you get more and more, uh, you get closer and closer to the data point. But it's not, you know, in some sense, it's not clear that you're doing a much better job, right? Because do you really think that this king here is real? So how do you decide whether that's the right thing to do? And what to stop in the degree of the polynomial, if you don't know a priori what the degree is? So if you were just to trust uh, the mean square error, so MSE here, so mean square error is just uh, you know, the, the mean of the square of the difference between the prediction and the data point. So if you plot this as a function of k, of course, it's, it's got to be a decreasing function of k, right? Because you add more and more features to your model, so you, you've got to do better in terms of, of, uh, of accuracy. Now, there's a problem with this, and it's called overfitting, meaning that if, if, you, if, you, if you really, for example, trust this, this, this k equal 15, what you may be fitting instead of you know, the actual model, you may be fitting the noise in your data. And one way to realize this is to, instead of, uh, of looking at how well 
your prediction does for uh, explaining the points that you use for the fitting, which are the black points. What if you take another data set, so you redo the experiment, so you redraw like 20, 20 data points here in green, and then you see how, how well your prediction does for those. And, and the, what will happen is that the, this red curve here will try to track the black points as well as possible, but th th that doesn't mean that we'll track well the green points. And what you can do is that you can plot the same MSE, so mean square error, but now instead of, uh, of tracking the black points, of looking at the difference between, with the black points, you look at the difference with the green points. And now you see a different per picture emerging. You see that initially it decreases because your, your fit is getting better, but then it starts increasing and it even starts increasing quite, quite dramatically. Question? Okay, so in, in general, that's always a good idea to do this kind of thing, that whenever you do a, a fitting procedure, to, try to always test it on not the data you used to fit, but another data set uh, for, to, be, to make sure that you're not fitting the noise. Okay, so the question is, there's no guarantee that the two data sets might be explained by the same model. Uh, well, I mean, that's, that's your responsibility as an experimenter, to do the, the experiment twice the same way, right? If you do twice the same experiment, and then if you don't think that it should be explained by the same model, that means you didn't actually do twice the same experiment. Now, it's, it's true that it's a good point, though, because many experimental assays have been shown to depend on the day you do it, and, you know, the particular experimental conditions you had, and that, that's, that's uh, further problems I, I will not discuss today. Uh, systematic error. Right. So that's actually two under sample set of data from one huge set of data that you believe. Yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 Y
I just replace epsilon here by y minus the polynomial, okay? So I replace the epsilon here by that, take the log, and that's what I, what, that's what I get, okay? This is just the prefactor, and this is the actual, what's in the, expo in the Gaussian, uh, in the exponential in the Gaussian. So now if you, if you look at this closely, <coughs> I said that when you do maximum likelihood, you, you, you're looking for the parameters of your model that maximize this likelihood. So let's examine what it means here. Here I have my f, which is just my polynomial, and I'm going to maximize this quantity. In other words, since the minus here, it's just boils down to minimizing this quantity. But what is this quantity? Do you recognize? I talked about it before, but I, I didn't actually define it formally. Sorry? Yeah, it's the MSC, so it's a mean square error. It's exactly that. So when you do maximum likelihood in that case, it's exactly the same thing as minimizing the mean square error. So you look for the parameters that minimize the distance between the, cur the theoretical curve and the experimental point. Now, you should note that this is done very commonly. Whenever you do a, a least square fitting, by, you know, the name contains it, least square fitting means we're just minimizing this, right? But in fact, the, the, the underlying assumption is that the noise is Gaussian. So when I say it was Gaussian, it sounded like a fairly you know, strong assumption, but in fact, that's, that's what everybody does. So maximum likelihood is just minimizing the mean square error. I also said that sigma was uh, also a parameter of the model. And in fact, you can also maximize this likelihood with respect to sigma square, right? So if you do this algebra, it's very simple. The, the sigma that best explains the model is also the mean square error. So that's, you try to minimize the mean square error, and the mean square error you find, the experimental error, is exactly the most likely error, which is not so, so, so much of a surprise. Now, all of this relied on this, you know, all, all of this was uh, the maximum likelihood approach. So that means you really take the parameters that best explain your data and you, you, know, you, you just use that. But let's think in terms of Bayesian terms again uh, and recall the, this, this picture I drawn. In, in this kind of picture, what you have is not just a single value, because sometimes maybe you shouldn't trust it that much. But instead, you have a, a spectrum of values with each of them assigned to, to probability. So we can actually do this in that case as well. We can write the probability of the, of the parameters theta. So here the parameters theta are the coefficients of the polynomial. And here uh, I, had to, I have to add a small something. So recall. I don't know if you can read from here, from up there. Uh, so this is my Gaussian model, right? It just tells me um, that's what I wrote before. So now what I can do is that I can rewrite this so I, you know, I do the Bayesian inversion. I assume a flat prior. And if I do this, I can rewrite this as so that's why I wrote up there.
Okay, so what have I done here? Here, this was the probability of the data given the model, and I can, I can decompose in this into two parts. One part is the, is the, the minimum mean square error, okay? So alpha, uh, sorry, A star, that's the one that minimizes this. So this is the minimum. But then for, you know, other values of A, which are not the optimal ones, I can develop this since it's all quadratic. I can always write it in this form, okay? In this quadratic form. So this is just M times the MSE. Okay, so that's the mean, that's the least mean square error. That's the, that's the minimum. And this is now my distribution over the parameters. So that's my posterior distribution of the parameters. Clearly, this will be maximum when A equals A star. That's the definition, definition of the optimum. And around that, it's, it behaves like a multi-dimensional Gaussian function. Yes, yes. I mean, this is just a rewriting of, I develop, so this depends on the data, yes. So if, if I expand this, uh, here this contains the data. So this is what I wrote here. Uh, this is the MSE, which depends, so it's the least mean square error, if you like. And this is the Gaussian fluctuations, if you like. Now, so you can view this, this Gaussian, as something equivalent to this, but in very large multidimensional space. Now, one thing I can do with this is that right now I, I told you, you know, how to find the best parameters, but how do I find the, the, the degree of the polynomial? So there was the technique uh, you know, I mentioned uh, briefly before, which was um, to just do the you know, test on the, on, the, on the second half of the data. But here we, we can actually do it directly somewhat uh, using this argument. Because the probability of a given degree, all I have to do, I just have to integrate the probability of this set of parameters over all sets of parameters. And if I do that, so I do this integral, it's a Gaussian integral, so I get determinants of A, which is this, this complex coefficients that contain, you know, that depend on the data. And here I get my uh, mean square error. Now, you can see also that this A here, it comes from a sum over M. So when you have a lot of data points, this, these coefficients A of this matrix A will scale like the number of data points you have. Okay? So in other words, A scales with like M, the number of data points. So because of that, this determinant here will scale like uh, M to the power K plus one, because you have K plus one parameters. Okay? So K plus one here is the dimension of the space, because you have K plus one parameters. And um, M here is the size of the matrix. Sorry, it's, it's the order of magnitude of the matrix. So this term here will scale like this. Now if you put all of this together, so this term plus this term, you end up with a formula like this. And uh, it's wrong in this slide. It wasn't in the previous slide. but. If you, so it's just a matter of convention, but people put minus two log P, okay? Don't ask me why. And if you do the math, you find that this is number of data points times the mean square error divided by sigma square plus K plus one log M. So now you want to maximize the likelihood, which means that you want to minimize this uh, so you, sorry, you want to minimize minus uh, you know, the likelihood, obviously. And this is made of two terms. One is the mean square error as before. So that's the, what we said before, that the more accurate you are, the better. And if you just add this term, of course, you always have an interest in having you know, a k that's as large as, as large as possible. 
But then you have the second term, which uh, increases with k, and that sets that would just set a penalty uh, for the for adding more parameters. Okay. And this whole thing here is called the BIC, which is, stands for Bayesian Information Criterion. So it's essentially, you know, the, the row likelihood you had before, plus to which you add this, this penalty. And here I showed it in this very simple Gaussian case, but people use it in, you know, in, in much more general setting whenever they can calculate the likelihood for any kind of probabilistic model. And so they call it the BIC, and it's minus 2 the log likelihood of the model, plus this penalty corresponding to the number of parameters. So I recall k plus 1 is the number of parameters, log m, uh, is, the, m is the number of data points. People also use another uh, penalty, although there is no such uh, you know, algebraic reason for it, they just do, called the IKK information criterion. In that case, it's minus 2 the likelihood, and this time you just add k plus, you know, you just add uh, the number of parameters. So you, you lose this log, uh, log m here. Excuse me. Yes. Can the BIC be generalized to other models where you're not just trying to find the degree of a polynomial? Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's my, that's why, you know, I, I said it too quickly. I mean, here I, I somewhat, I somewhat proved it, if you like, in the case of a polynomial. It will hold more generally because at the end of the day, because of the saddle point approximation, which you know, I'm going to give a, say a word about uh, in the next slide, uh, you know, everything, you know, this, this posterior distribution here will always behave somewhat like a Gaussian, right? And so because of that, this argument will hold for any kind of model. So th this is very general. This is not just for fitting a polynomial, it could work for any model where you have a certain number of parameters and you, you want to compare different models with different number of parameters. And so it, it's, it's to solve the, the following problem is that very often if you have a model that has more rich, so it has more parameters, it will always perform better in terms of uh, the likelihood, or in that case in terms of the accuracy of the prediction. But at the same time, you know, you may be overfitting. So this BIC is a, is a convenient way to add this penalty corresponding to the n number of parameters. It helps you, you know, uh, choose between, between uh, have a trade-off between too rich and not rich enough models. And the AIC does pretty much the same thing, it's just a different choice of the penalty. Yes? But the, all the models have to be nested, right? It cannot work for non-nested So the question is, do the models have to be nested, meaning that, you know, the the model with more parameters would, would include the model with less parameters. And, um, well, you, you would think so, but I don't think that's what people do. People will also, uh, well, in the case I gave, it clearly was nested. But more generally, people will use it even for models that cannot be nested. So com two completely different hypotheses. For example, you want to fit with an exponential, or you want to fit with a polynomial. And you know, the polynomial can be degree 10, and the exponential will just have two parameters. So it could be that your polynomial will do better because it has degree 10, right? But the exponential would be a you know, a, a more parsimonious description, so it will win according to the BIC. Yes? Um, so the load term in the BIC expression, does it mean that uh, it makes more sense Yes, indeed. So if you, if you look at this, so it, it's more apparent here in the previous expression. The log likelihood here, I, as I said in the very first slide, typically scales with the number of data points because it's a sum of the log likelihood of each of the data points. And you could see it better in this expression, right? So this scales with uh, the number of, uh, of data points. This scales with the log of the number of data points. So if you have more and more data points, this will always win, right? So the more data points you have, um, the more you're encouraged to add parameters. Now, the, you know, they might, it also depends on what the true degree, for example, of your polynomial is, right? If, you, if the true degree of your polynomial is three, you may have, you know, infinite number of data points, you may still conclude that three is the best explanation. 
just because it is, right? I don't know, I mean, because I think... It's not really that you're encouraged, but you're penalized less for Yeah, well, if, you, if, you're, if your polynomial is really a degree three and you have infinite amount of data, adding to degree four will not decrease this at all, of only very, very small margin. So this penalty would also be very small compared to the number of data points, but the, you know, the two are very small, so three might still win. Now, if you have data that's actually much more complicated than the polynomial, that let's say polynomial was not the right description, then in that case, you're right, the more data points you have, the more degree you can add to your polynomial. So this is what it looks like for the example I gave. This is the result of the BIC. Uh, and you see it decreases in the initially up to value 3, and then it rises again. And, and that's no accident. That's because the true degree of the polynomial was actually 3. And the AIC, you can see it puts a much smaller penalty on the number of parameters. So it actually is pretty flat, and it will tell you that 3 is just as good as 15, which I don't think is really, uh, is really true in that case. So you know, I, I would prefer the BIC. It's more principled. Also seems to work better in that case. So, so I, I said something about the saddle point. Uh, the statement is the following, is that even if you're not fitting a polynomial, even if you have a very complicated model, in general, if you have many data points, you, that means that you, you, can, you can pin your parameters pretty well. In other words, the distribution of the, in the posterior distribution of parameters will be very peaked around a, you know, its most likely value, A star, right? So we can always write it in some Gaussian way like this using the standard point approximation. It's just to say that if something is very peaked, then everything looks Gaussian. Now, uh, and, and these, uh, these coefficients here are just obtained as the Hessian of the likelihood around your, your, your startup point. This thing is called the Fisher information matrix. And it gives you useful, useful information about how exactly you pinned your parameters. So, so of course, using integration rules, um, you can get the covariance of your, of your uh, inferred parameters as a function of A, it's just the inverse of the function A. And the kind of situation you can detect is this. That imagine you have two parameters, right? And this, is, this will be the optimal value of the parameter. So this matrix will tell you that you're very peaked around this, but how exactly are you peaked? For example, you could, peaked, you could be peaked like this. So here I'm representing the you know, iso-level lines of, of this distribution. So you're fairly peaked, but in fact, you're much more peaked in that direction than in this direction. In other words, it could be here that the difference between A1 and A2 is very well pinned by the data, so you can determine this very well. But the, the absolute value of A1 and A2 itself, they can be somewhat loose, okay? And this will all contain in this covariance matrix. Because the covariance matrix is just another rep representation of the direction of, this, uh, of these ellipses. And you can show that this is actually the uncertainty you have about your parameters is given by this covariance matrix, uh, and uh, this is given by the kramer rao bound. Okay. Um, any questions so far? There's been some questions. So, so now there was the part of my talk that completely disappeared. So I, I'm not sure exactly what to do about it. Uh, I, I'll do it on the board, I guess. Okay, so th this, you know, this was somewhat tedious introduction to Bayesian inference, maximum likelihood, and that kind of thing. 
And now the question is, this is of course a school about biological systems, so you could ask, you know, does biology care about maximum likelihood at all? So this is a bit of an intermission because the techniques I've talked about here is, is mostly techniques for you, you know, as, a, as an experimental, as a theorist analyzing data to make sense out of the data. So now I'm, I'm asking a slightly different question, which is, do cells actually care about maximum likelihood and concepts like this? So let me take a, an example, which is concentration sensing by cells. So imagine you, you're a cell, and you want to know what's the external concentration of, a, of, of something, typically food or, or, you know, or poisons or things you, know, you want to know about. So if it's food, for example, if there's a lot of food, you'd be happy where you are. Uh, if there's little food, you want to go somewhere else. So as a single cell, you, you, you always try to get, take cues from the environment and you try to get cues about what the concentration of different ligands are. And the way cells do this is that they have um, receptors that stick out of the, of the cell membrane that can bind the ligands they're interested in and then unbind them. Right. So you have some, some ligand in concentration C. Here I showed the ligand with these small balls. And this ligand will come and bind a given receptor with the rate K plus times C. Okay? And then this receptor will detach with the rate k minus. Now, what the receptor sees, so now you have to put yourself on the point of view of the receptor or, you know, or the cell that all it has is the receptors to know about the outside world. What the receptor sees is really something like this. Okay? It's this time, and this, this is when the receptor is bound, and this is when it's unbound. So all the receptor has access to is a time trace right, of zero and ones. Right? This is called a telegraphic process. And that's what the receptor sees, but what it actually wants to know is this, is this uh, concentration C. So how should it do that, right? Well, one clue is, is that the probability of being bound, which I call P, so it's the fraction of time that the receptor will spend being bound by the ligand, is given simply by this formula. So if the receptor can get an estimate of how often it is bound, maybe it can back out what the concentration is because this fraction of time being bound is, is not exactly proportional, but it's a function of, it's a uh, make it is function, make it is maintained function of the concentration, okay? And in fact, that's roughly what, you know, roughly speaking, that's what cells actually do. That they will integrate, uh, Whenever the thing is bound, they'll, get, they'll be active and they'll signal. And then the cumulated activity over a certain time will be encoded in the in, you know, intracellular concentrations of, of some signaling molecules. So what the cell does is that it will estimate C to be something like, it will try to estimate something like this. So you can convince yourself that, well, P, probability of being bound is, is equal to that, right? So if you use this plus that, you invert, and you get that C is pretty much the ratio of the time bound over the time unbound, right? Make, which makes sense. 
And in practice, that's what cells pretty much do. Uh, so how can you define it average over so yes, in yeah. the window? Yeah, so here I average over window T, which is, would be by definition T. In practice, the cell doesn't actually do that. It doesn't actually have a fixed window. It has some integration time, which is decaying exponentially, which it has to do with the turnover of the signaling molecules. But effectively, it was, you know, this is just to simplify, right? Um, so the cell has some memory of what happened. If the, cell, if, if the receptor only had its current memory, it's 0, 1. So it's very, li it's very little information when you just have a binary information, bound and unbound. That's very little information about the concentration. However, if you can integrate over time, then you can integrate how often you were bound, and that's directly linked to the concentration. So you can get a readout of the concentration by just performing this calculation, which cells put, you know, that's pretty much what they do. For example, in chemotaxis, E. coli trying to find nutrients, uh, it will do something very similar to this. It will have some internal concentration uh, in the form of a phosphorated um, version of a, of a molecule called QI uh, that will be directly linked to the concentration outside. So that's what the cell does, and you know, it sounds like, I mean, that sounds like the sensi sensible thing to do, right? But is it really the best thing to do? I mean, do, do, does anyone here have an idea of what one should do? If, if I give you this trace and ask you what's the, what's the concentration, what was the concentration, what would you do? Would you do that like the cell? Would you just take you know, the, the average time you, you, got, you got bound, or would you do something else? Any ideas? OK. <laughs> well, I'm not really expecting you to to find the, the, the solution. But OK, you can think in terms of maximum likelihood. OK, so how would you do that? You would say, OK, I've, I have no idea what the concentration would, uh, should be. So I have no prior over it. So I'll just say that I just try to maximize the likelihood of my trace given the concentration. And I'm going to try and maximize this over the concentration. So what is the property of a given trace if you know a given concentration? Well, it's not that hard to calculate. Um, the, the whole time I was bound, and I remained bound, okay, and that would just give me exponential minus tb times k minus, okay? Because here I get unbound with rate k minus. So that that's corresponds to the time I remained bound. Then there's the time I remained unbound, and that's just exponential minus tu k plus c, okay? Questions? No? Then is the binding events themselves. So here something happens, it got unbound. So that's k minus to the power n. n is the number of unbinding events. And then is all the events where it, 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 it got bound. Here I should put proportional to. And that's k plus c, the rate of being bound to the power n and number of binding events. Okay. Here I'm, I'm assuming there are as many binding as there are unbinding events, as there should. I mean, you can differ by plus or minus one, but it doesn't really matter. So that's my expression. Now, if I, if I do maximum likelihood, what do I do? I just have to take the, so I'm taking, always taking the, derivative of the, of the log of p, and you can see here why it's, it's a good idea to do this. What I notice is that, well, this term doesn't depend on c, so I don't really have to care about it, right? When I take the log, that will disappear. Neither does this term. So what do I end up with? I, I, uh, I take the derivative of the log, and I get n 
over C. Wait, did I? I'm going to get something wrong for sure. Minus Tu K plus, right? Since I don't have my notes, I don't have anything. Um, <laughs> if you can spot an error, please do. <laughs> OK, so I want this to be equal to 0 just because I want to maximize it. So I, what do I find? I find C equal uh, n over Tu k plus. I think that's right. So if I were a cell I wanted to do maximum likelihood, I would do something like this. Okay? And here you see it's not really related to the average to the time that they remain bound or unbound. It's linked to the number of binding events, right? And the time it remained unbound. Now, th these two formulas are really not equivalent. They don't give the same, the same prediction. I mean, you can show algebraically that these are two different things. But on average, so if you have infinite amount of data, they will give you the same answer, right? Which is the true answer. So in, infinite amount of data here, I mean infinite integration time. If you wait longer and longer, then you end up always getting the right answer. But you, ca you can. Um, you can compare the two different methods by seeing how well they will predict the true concentration. And uh, so one method I would call uh, average receptor occupancy. And this is the results obtained by, in a paper, a very important paper of Berg and Purcell in 1977. And the alternative would be maximum likelihood. And this is more recent work by uh, <coughs> Andres and Wing Green and uh, myself and Wing Green. And So you can estimate the average error you make, so the relative error. Yes? So, so what do you mean that the cell in a given time frame, they, well, the cell doesn't take into account, uh, doesn't, well, they miss the piece of information of the number of events of being bound or unbound, which you catch in the maximum likelihood method? Well, actually, you see the solution to the, well, I haven't really stated the puzzle yet. I mean, I haven't really told you what the difference between the two things, the two performances is. But it's not that maximum likelihood takes information into account that receptor occupancy doesn't. It's rather the, other, the, the opposite, is that maximum likelihood throws away information that's useless for, for, for detecting the, the, the concentration. But I, I'll, I'll explain this in a second. So you can do a calculation, you can show that the error you get when you do the average receptor occupancy scales like 2 over n, where n is the number of binding events. Okay. And it's a, it's a classical scaling. Whenever you, know, you have uh, independent events, the, the kind of error you will find is always 1 over square root of n. Right? So here you have the factor 2. If you do maximum likelihood, however, if you use this formula instead, there's a factor 2 difference. So you, you do better doing this than doing that, right? than doing that cells, what cells actually do. So, so what's the reason for this? Well, it's, it has to do with what I said here. Maximum likelihood doesn't care about these guys, right? It doesn't care about the unbinding events. All it cares about is when it's unbound, at some point it will get bound, and the time it remains unbound, that depends on the concentration. The rate of binding, that depends on concentration. What happens once it's bound doesn't depend on concentration at all. It only has to do with the you know, intrinsic receptor properties. And that's not informative about the concentration at all. However, when you do this, 
you do have this time bound, which uh, you integrate, so to integrate is the time you're being bound. So when you do Berg and Purcell, you add two sources of stochasticity. It's the, one is the true one, which has to do with the stochasticity of binding events. So it's this one. And this one you cannot suppress. There's nothing you can do about that, right? It's when you're not bound, you have to wait for the next molecule to pass by. And that's really what limits physically your capacity to detect concentrations. But once you're bound, the time that you remain bound is also stochastic and has nothing to do with concentration. So that's another source of stochasticity that will uh, hurt your prediction. So this will give a 1 over n, and this will give a 1 over n as well. When you do Bergen Postel, you add the two. When you do maximum likelihood, you only add the one that's, that's really unavoidable. So, yes? Based on Kramer Rao bound, just to increase the, the, the lower limit that you can get. Okay, so, so, so uh, Kramer Rao bound, so it's exactly how we obtain this, by the way. That, that's the, that's the yeah, but we call it a bound, but uh, really in the thermodynamic limits, it's not a bound, it's a tight bound, right? The tight bound meaning that it's a limit. So it's, it's, it's called a bound because even for finite data, it's still a bound, right? But when n goes to infinity, it's actually a, a precise limit. Okay. So that means that the strategy with the maximum likelihood is basically the best that the cell can do? Yeah. Well, I mean, it really means that this here is not a bound, but it's really a precise asymptotic statement. Maybe that's another way of answering your question. Yeah. And, and yes, well, what is the best thing you can do? Yeah, I think yes, because almost by definition of maximum likelihood. Uh, I mean, can, is your question whether you can go more, below yeah. 1 over n? In a sense, it was even more a formal question in the sense that when you do this question and you find this result, you're pretty sure that there is no other sensing strategy for the cells that give you a better... Uh, no, I don't, I don't think... I, well, okay. Can I, you add, is it possible to, to answer that question or to say that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm, uh, yes, I mean, this is the best thing you can do if you have this setup, okay. Um, but then that's assumed that really you have this trace, you can do whatever you do, whatever you, you, you want with it. And uh, biochemically, doing maximum likelihood might be a bit more complicated than just looking at receptor occupancy. So that, that's what I wanted to, to mention now. Because, so, so the problem here you see is the stochasticity in the, in the duration of the binding events. So the problem is that the cell, usually what it does is that it's being active while it's being bound. So the integrated activity, which would just be the area under this curve, will be, will be you know, basically what it will use to infer the concentration. Um, but what it should really do is that for each binding event, it should just you know, integrate one instead of integrating the time it will remain bound. Um, so, something that would be more advantageous for the cell to do is that whenever it's bound, instead of having a burst of activity that's stochastic, it should have some burst of activity that's almost deterministic, right? meaning that a fixed area. So then you get the next event, the next event. That's what you would want a cell to do. Right. Whenever it binds the thing, then it starts a cycle of activity that has deterministic uh, output and, and not a stochastic output. And in fact, you can make this more precise. If you, seen that, if you assume that you're in the low occupancy limits, uh, you can call something CV coefficient of variation would be uh, something like so the area here under the, the, the signal, well, let me, I won't give it a name, I just represent it. So CV will be 
basically the relative variations of that area for each of the binding events. Okay? And in that case, this is only true in the weak binding limit, so when it, the receptor is, is not uh, bound very often, so we have low concentrations. You can show that this is actually a more general formula. It's 1 plus Cv over n. So when this is completely stereotypical, so you always get the same response for each binding event, then you get 1 over n. And in the case when you have exponentially distributed waiting time, which is the case when you have to wait for the thing to be unbound, then uh, Cv is exactly equal to 1. It's just a coefficient of variation of an exponential distribution. In that case, you get 2. Okay. So, okay, so for the receptor, as I said, it's pretty hard to achieve something like this. But are there, you know, could there be other examples where, you know, biological systems do something like this? Yes. Isn't that how uh, the neuron responds to uh, the concentration of the neurotransmitter? Just encoding two frequencies instead of integrating over uh, You mean like a, uh, in a synapse where you release the chemo? Yeah. No, that's, well, that would be one example. Like you, you get the signal and then it releases a certain number of, uh, of, of chemicals and that number was, it was the thing was prepackaged, so it would release a fixed number. That, that would be an example. There are other examples in uh, ion-gated channels. So yeah, ligand-gated uh, ion channels, sorry, which are also uh, important in neuroscience. But I'm going to give another example from neuroscience, which is, I think, more, even more striking, because it was demonstrated experimentally. And unfortunately, well, I don't have the slide, but I can, I can explain what the system is, roughly. I don't know what I would do that. So now it's, it's not a receptor anymore. It's a, it's a molecule, rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is a, is a molecule that's in, that are in the retina and are sensitive to light, okay? And what happens is that when uh, rhodopsin gets hit by light, it will start becoming active, and then it will remain active, you know, it will have a, a curve of activity that looks something like this, or maybe looks something like this. People don't really know. So whenever it gets hit by light, it gets excited, and then you know it gets unexcited, but in a almost continuous manner, or it remains excited for a time that's that's quite reproducible. So what's nice is that people have been able to to measure directly uh, the CV, so this CV, which is this variation coefficient of variation in rhodopsin activity. Upon yeah. Yeah. So the true thing is that it probably goes something like. The reason why it, people believe it's something like this is because rhodopsin has six sites that can get uh, activated, and so people believe that it goes through a series of six decays. But it could be that it's active as long as it has at least one active. So then in that case, it would be like this. This is, is not entirely reproducible. This is some stochasticity, OK? And, and one, can, uh, one can just show uh, well, the probability distribution of this CV, OK? And so they did experiments where they could actually knock out some of these sites. And in particular, they can get to a situation where they get just one site active. So if you get just one site active, the time it will remain active is exactly like for a receptor. It will be exponentially distributed. So the, the probability of CV will be just an exponential. Okay? And then you get CV equal 1. So that's a, that's a mutant. Now, if you look at the wild type, which has its own all is six sites, but they also try all mutations where they knock one, two, three, four, five. Then it looks something much more reproducible, so something much more peaked. Uh, 
uh, and in that case, you can get CV of the order of 0.3. And this is, you know, here we're getting much closer to maximum likelihood. So why is it important actually for, for this system? Because this determines the sensitivity of... You mean mean CV, right? Our CV is, uh, yeah, it's the mean square difference. It's, it's the width of that guy, right? Uh, relative. No, oh, sorry, no, I, I'm completely, okay, I'm, I'm cracking up. This is not P of CV, sorry. This is P of activity. Well, activity is, uh, you know, the area under that curve, right? Sorry. And CV is the coefficient of variation of that activity. So why is this important? It's because uh, this will determine whether the system can distinguish seeing a photon or not seeing a photon, right? Because imagine that the activity that you have for a single photon looks, the distribution looks like this, right? So that's if you have one photon. But then if you imagine you have zero photon, you probably also get some background activity, right? Just because there's noise in the system. So how can you be, you know, the most likely activity you would get from one photon is exactly the same as you would get if you had zero photon. So you cannot really distinguish the two. Now if you're in that, in that situation, the background noise might st still be something like this. In that case, you can reliably detect the difference between having seen one photon and having seen zero. Right? It depends, of course, on the background noise. But in practice, if you look at the output of these, of these cells, of the, photo, of the uh, photoreceptor cells, you can see that you can reliably distinguish situations where they respond to, situ to one photon to situations where they don't. And people have shown, doing psychophysics experiments, that uh, human beings are actually able to uh, detect signal photons. And it has to do with this property of Rhodopsin that he has an activity that's reproducible and not like for ligand binding. So to answer the question in the beginning, do, do, you know, should biologists care about maximum likelihood? Well, I think this shows that maybe they, it should. Right? Here, using this, the, the naive Berg and Purcell uh, arguments, we found a performance that was significantly worse than the one you would get using maximum likelihood. And then you know, looking for systems where it actually does something closer to the maximum likelihood, we find some strategies, such as the one in Rolofsen. Okay. But is it just the case when you have very low motor processors or low concentration? Yes. If you have many receptors, you just take the... Well, yeah, if you have many receptors, you can always compensate by the number of receptors. But the, the point is that many, many of the systems really work exactly at the physical limit, meaning that they, you know, they really try to optimize everything about, about what they do, right? So of course they have a many receptors, but then they don't have a very large integration time. And then they still have to respond to nanomolar concentrations, right? So you have all these constraints that, they, that make that they always work at the limits. So any, any improvement could be variable. Just turns out that this improvement here, the proposed one, if you were to re-engineer E. coli, then instead of doing that, removing the stochasticity at this, at this stage, uh, I don't think that would be so easy because uh, I didn't talk about it, but you would need to have some out of equilibrium loop to be able to achieve something like this. Uh, so you need to pump energy into the system to get a reliable response. To beat the stochasticity, it's a you know, general statement, you, you need to in, in, inject energy into the system, right? And here the energy is naturally provided by the, by the photon itself just gives the energy to put the system in a, in a you know, high energy state and then it will decay from that. Here, no energy is pumped in by the ligands. So, you know, the off rate has to be stochastic. And the only way it could be not stochastic is by having energy being pumped in from somewhere else, like having ATP somewhere. So, it's not clear it's worth the effort, in other words. Okay, so the... The thing is that now I have 10 minutes left. 
but uh, right. Okay. Uh, again, this was slides, so I have to. It will be slower, unfortunately. Do you on the board? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> the time, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the last topic I wanted to 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 tell you about is um, maximum entropy. So the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because it's a technique that's been, uh, you know, gaining new popularity in the past 10 years. Uh, it's a technique that was first uh, invented or formalized by Jens in 57. And uh, only recently, with the advent of, uh, you know, new high throughput data, people have been, you know, uh, thinking again at, the, at these techniques and uh, try to use them on actual data. So, and this will also serve as an introduction maybe to what, uh, what uh, Gaspar Kacik will be, talk be, be talking about, about neurons. Uh, and I wanted to show you, uh, you know, a few examples, but since I don't have the slides, uh, that would be a bit difficult, I'm afraid. So, uh, so I introduce the method and then I explain what's the link to maximum likelihood. And then if I have time, I, I, I'll give you uh, an example of how to use it. So imagine that you have Yeah, let me let me state briefly that you know why this maximum entropy uh, is you know in what situations that might be useful that's typically in cases where you have many variables that could, that are strongly correlated with each other, okay? So there are many inter interdependencies between them and you'd like to uncover them. What you have is a bunch of data points. So you have many data, data samples uh, of these different variables being arranged in, in, in different configurations. So let's say that you can describe the system by a set of n variables. So your n variables could be n agents, it could be uh, n neurons, it could be n cells, it could be n individuals, it could be uh, n amino acids along uh, you know, the primary structure of a, of, a, of a protein, it could be n nucleotides along DNA, it could be any, you know, it could be n genes interacting with each other, so it could be any uh, degrees of freedom in a, in a complex system, okay? And you want to have a probabilistic modeling of these variables. So the, the strategy of maximum entropy is to look for a distribution, for this distribution P, which is in, in very highly dimensional space, uh, that we will have the maximum entropy. So you want to We want to maximize the Shannon entropy. So why do we want to we, we want to do this? Because entropy, as you know, uh, is a quantification of randomness, right? The more random the distribution is, the higher its entropy. So we want a, a distribution that's as random as possible. But of course, if we do this, we just end up with the uniform distribution because that's the most uh, you know that's the most random one. So what we add uh, to this is, is, a, is a constraint that we want this distribution to reproduce a few average observables of, of our data, okay? So you have a set of observables. So this whole thing here called uh, sigma with an arrow in it. So you have a set of observables and The constraint is that you want so this is the model distribution. The average of these observables in the model 
to be equal to the empirical average. So what could these observables be? This is somewhat abstract here. Uh, they could just be, for example, the, the average of your variable. So you want the average of a certain, you know, of each of your variables to be the same in the, in the data as it is in your model, okay? So you want to basically faithfully reproduce the frequencies of, of uh, sorry, the, the, the average values of your variable in the model. So that, that's the minimal requirement. Then you may also want to impose something on the correlation functions. Oh, sorry, there's no uh, arrow here. Because you have a strongly interacting system with correlations everywhere, you may want your model to also uh, reproduce the correlation functions between your variables. Okay? But you can really add whatever you want. I mean, you can add higher order correlation functions. You can add global observables. You can add whatever you want. The point is that I'm not going to do the calculation, but you can check it your, yourself, is that if you maximize the Shannon entropy, so the, this thing, subject to these constraints using the technique of uh, Lagrange multipliers, you will find that your distribution must take the following form. So here, these are the Lagrange multipliers, and they correspond to this constraint. This also is a Lagrange multiplier, which corresponds to the constraint that you want your sum, the sum of probabilities to be equal to 1, so just a normalization. And this is your form you get. So the interesting thing about this form is that uh, it looks very much like a uh, you know, Boltzmann distribution in statistical mechanics. So if you interpret this as minus energy of your configuration divided by KBT, this is just Boltzmann law. Okay? Now imagine that you know, what you wanted to um, constrain were the, your first your one point marginal, you, sorry, your, your, your one point function and your two point functions here. If you do that, so forgetting the three point function, then it will take this form, for example. Now, if you look at this, not only you recognize the Boltzmann form, but here you recognize the Ising model. So it's a special form of Ising model where you have completely disordered couplings and you have a disordered uh, fields as well. Okay? So, so now the, the game in terms of fitting is that you, because knowing the form here doesn't really solve the problem. You still have a task to do, which is to find the Lagrange multipliers here that will satisfy these constraints. And this is a, a quite hard problem to solve in, in practice because you need first to solve, for example, in the Ising model case, you need to solve the, this problem, first of all. You need to calculate, you'll be able to calculate the correlation functions from the fields and couplings between the variables. And that's very hard in, you know, in general. That's the, you know, most of spin gas physics was about solving such, such problems and it's notoriously hard. So you can do it by, with Monte Carlo or techniques like that. And I think uh, Gaspar will, will talk uh, quite a great deal about it. Um, yes, so now the, the link to maximum likelihood is the following. Is that if instead of saying, okay, I want to start from the principle of maximum entropy and maximize 
my entropy subject to some constraint, I could start by saying that, OK, I think my model is, uh, you know, well, let's say a nice model. So let's say something like this. And now I want to maximize uh, the likelihood of the data over the parameters. So my parameters here are h and j. And if you do this, so this is the, the we go back to the maximum likelihood of the data given the parameters. So the setas here are now h's and j's. So you have data points, so you have data samples in practice, which is just different configurations, which you denote by sigma m. And you have m of them, so it's the same m as before. And the log level of the data given the parameters is just given by this, where each of those, for example, in that case, is given uh, by what's in this exponential. minus log z, OK? Now, you can, again, I'm not going to I'm not going to give the detail of the calculation, but you can show quite easily that if you maximize this likelihood with respect to, for example, the parameter h, hi, this will imply precisely that sigma i in the model is equal to, on average, sigma i in the data. And if you do the same thing for jij, you get the same, exactly the same statement for the correlation functions. So in that case, th th these are two uh, complementary views of the problem. Either you can start from the constraints and you know build up the model from the maximum entropy principle, but some people prefer to do the other way around. And that's, for example, uh, Hinton in the, uh, in the 80s invented the, the Boltzmann machine, which is exactly doing this uh, inverse problem. They prefer to state that, OK, we start from a nicing model uh, with you know, disordered couplings, and we look for the couplings and fields that best explain the data. Okay? The, the two procedures are completely equivalent. They all always boil down to matching the, uh, the, the average observables of the model to the data. So I, I think I will have to stop uh, soon, and so I, I won't have to, but you know, I don't think I have time to one introduce. Can you just give one example? In two minutes. In two minutes. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that will be hard. So I'm not going to talk about neurons, because uh, Gasper will talk about it extensively. Uh, I'm going to talk about maybe another system. OK, maybe I, I can try and pull out some slides from somewhere else, if I can. Huh? Votes. OK. So that would be much faster, it's true, with the so let me give an exa a concrete example. Um, let's say you have data where you have the precise. So this is a problem of collective behavior. So a very good example of correlated uh, 
uh, system, you have birds that all fly in the same direction. And they do it by basically uh, interacting with each other. Okay? So we like to understand that. Now imagine that you have the position and velocities of all the birds uh, given by ex experimenters, in that case, uh, a group of André Cavagna and, and Irene Giardina in Rome. And now your variable, which, is, which was my sigma i here, would be just the orientation of each of these birds. So what you want to do is that you want to constrain the correlation functions, as I explained here, between these birds, and you use the maximum entropy uh, principle, and you get exactly this distribution, except you don't have any fields because of the symmetry between the different directions. Uh, so here, note that the, sig the sigmas are orienta 3D orientation, so they're continuous variable. Uh, the model you have here is not exactly an Ising model, it's a Heisenberg model on a lattice, but it's, you know, it's the same idea. And, okay, you can skip that. Uh, what you can do now is using maximum likelihood, you can, so you have to parameterize your interaction matrix, and you end up with two parameters. Uh, one is the strength of uh, interaction between two neighboring birds, and the other one has to do with what you define to be a neighbor, NC. So NC will set the number of neighbors you interact with, okay? So in that case, six. And NC is an adjustable parameter. How are we going to find it? We're precisely going to find it by maximizing the likelihood of the data given NC, okay? And if you do that, you have a likelihood, which is P of the data given, the, given NC, and C, and you find something like that, okay? So it peaks at some NC value, which you learn directly from the data, okay? So why is that useful? Uh, okay, so you can explain many things about it. I mean, you can explain basically uh, the long range order in the system with this model. It's just uh, to show that the model works. Now, the, the thing that this uh, inference here of NC gives you is the, in, essentially the interaction range in the, in the flock. And there had been a, a debate, and I'll finish with this, in the community of collective behavior of whether this interaction range was metric or topological. And to explain it, let me just give you, you know, an example. If, it, if it's metric, uh, essentially that means that you, are, you interact with the number of birds, is, which is not fixed, but it depends on the density, because you interact with everyone within a radius RC of yourself, okay? Now, if that's the case, if, you, if the density of the bird increases, of the flock increases, then you end up interacting with many more people. Uh, conversely, if you have a topological interaction range, that means that you always interact with, let's say, six birds, no matter what the density is, right? So effectively reducing uh, the interaction range in meters when you increase the density. So in one case, in that case, you just have a constant NC, no matter what the density is. And in that case, you would have an NC that would scale with the interbird distance exactly in that manner. Okay, so these are two competing hypotheses. And using the data we have and maximum likelihood, we can just infer the NC for a bunch of different flocks of different densities. So we can get points, many points along this curve. And the answer is this. You find a straight line. So this completely answers the question, the interaction range has got to be topological and not metric, as uh, a lot of people uh, previously thought. So this is, uh, this is it, and you know, we can also show that well, it's around 21, but the, the important thing is it does not depend on, on flux density. It also doesn't depend on flux size. And uh, I'll end with this. Thank you for your attention.